just want to do a quick intro. Um, sure, perfect. So as you guys know, I'm on the other side of the world. <laughs> but I'm still here, kind of. <laughs> yeah, I'm so excited that we. I'm still able to, you know, um, facilitate, coordinate these workshops from here. Like Skills Exchange is still a big part of my life and it will continue to be. I'm hoping to use um, my master's in management and leadership to grow the network and possibly venture out into um, new kind of opportunities for all of us as women. Um, the other day I realized that all the women in my class are all from Africa and that was just like, yes. <laughs> I'm ready, you know, to network and just, you know, kind of just draw strings from these women as well and hopefully allow that to influence, yeah, the growth within yeah. Skills Exchange. Um, yeah. yeah, so I'm gonna do lots of networking, but um, today's not about me. Today is about you guys <laughs> and Amy. <laughs> this specific topic has been coming along between Amy and I, we've been chatting about it since the birth of Skills Exchange. Um, and I think it's so important to be self-aware and also understand how you can leverage on your self-awareness to become a better person, but not only like in the workplace, but just like overall as like a human being. I think mm -hmm. being a decent human being is like, you know, top priority <laughs> for me in oh, my, yeah. my, <laughs> my self-worth in, in my life. And yeah, so I'm really excited for today. Um, and yeah, so we'll have an hour um, session and then a Q&A at the end if you have any questions. So, um, but it might go a little over. So just to let you know in advance, if you do have time, then stay. But if you don't, like we understand. And yeah, so... Take over, Amy. Thanks, Stace. Can everyone see my screen yet? So bear with, bear with. Can everyone see my screen? Yep. Perfect. Okay. So, um, Good morning, ladies. Just a brief introduction as well to who I am, a uh, little bit about myself as well before we get into the session. So um, my name is Amy Smith and I've been a member of Skills Exchange, I think, um, yeah, pretty much since the beginning, one of the first members, definitely. Um, I'm 28 years old and I've been in the HR profession for seven years, um, very much with my passion being um, industrial and, and organizational psychology. I was born and bred in Cape Town and have now settled in Reading, England. So I've been here for about, yeah, more than a year already. And I was fortunate enough to, um, yeah, to have a British passport through, through my father. So I've, you know, taken the plunge and, and made the move last year to the UK. Um, just about myself and my personality as well, love of dogs, those that know me know that I'm yeah, pretty much obsessed with dogs, um, diversity and um, my slightly insane obsession with dimples as well. Um, <laughs> so today we are connecting about EQ and personal effectiveness, so how do we become, how do we become more personally effective through EQ? And before we kind of um, get into sort of, you know, the, the content of the session, just a couple of, um, I guess, you know, ground rules etiquette, if we call it that. Um, so we are, we are recording today's session and, um, you know, we, 
we might share it, might not share it, depending on, um, you know, if, if everyone's comfortable with that or not. Um, your cameras can stay on or off, and please do keep yourself muted, but it is going to be a very interactive session, so I definitely do want to hear from you. And can I just ask that if you are engaging, um, you know, in, in any discussion or, or asking any question that you, you put your camera on so that I can see you as well and, yeah, kind of put a, put a face as well to, to the voice. Um, so what I want to hear from you first is um, why did you show up today and what are you hoping to gain from today's session? I'll go first. Um, I'm very much interested in what you have to say today. I didn't come with any expectations, but it's obviously something that resonated with me. Um, and so, yeah, I'm here because um, I really, really am interested in this topic. And I'm hoping to learn um, <clears throat> some useful um, tips and things that I could actually use because obviously this year has been insane. Um, and it's just getting more and more interesting. So yeah, I'm here with no expectations, but just um, I'm open to learn and to get some useful tips that I can use um, going forward. Thank right. you. Thanks, Hi, Amy. Hi. And I'm here to hear you speak today. This is the first for me, so I'm looking forward to it. And also, you're never too old to learn. Well said, well said. Um, so I'll go. I think this is the first for me as well. So I think I just, I, I, I really want to know how I can effectively use my, my EQ. I think we, mm. we struggle so much at work, relating to other people. So it's, it's, it's so, it's, it's a great opportunity to know how to use it where and, you know, so that you're not offending the next person by trying to be, you know, all emotionally okay, you know. So I think that's that's why I'm here. But I, I'm really not, um, I'm just here to observe. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for yeah. sharing, Sia. I think you said something really um, good there, that there's some challenges and I'm, I'm keen to hear from everybody. Um, you know, if there are challenges that you feel particularly you face with EQ or, or your emotions um, in general, I'm definitely keen to, to hear about that as well. Um, with the emotional intelligence test link that we sent out, I am curious to hear from any of you if you've completed that and um, if any of you were surprised at all by the results or score that you got at the end of that. I'll go first because I was excited to do it because as I say, I've never done anything like this before. So I did it and I'm not too sure what to make of the results. Okay, what uh, did your results say? So for self-awareness, I got 12. And okay. for self-regulation, I got nine. For motivation, eight. Empathy, 14. And social skills, 11. Um, I don't know what is good, what is bad, but I'm thinking that if it's a low number, it needs working on. That's correct. Yeah, that would be that would be the correct assumption. And the nice thing with um, with those EQ tests is you can quickly identify where the scores are low and where the scores are high. So you know what particular component of EQ it is that you need to um, you know need to work on a bit more that you could definitely improve on as well. Um, if you haven't done the test, no worries. There's still time to do it as well. Um, it's really just for your own purposes, for your personal growth, and just to help you to identify, like I said, those areas where, um, you know, where you can improve or where you might want your score to, um, to be higher as well. So, ladies, does anyone know what EQ is? Does anyone have um, kind of an idea, rough outline of what they think EQ might be? So there's silence. So does that mean no one knows? <laughs> I, I've always, I mean, I've just always thought about it. I mean, in general, I, I think of emotional intelligence and yeah. um, 
and if you think about emotions, um, it's, I suppose it's just dealing with how you deal with various situations mm. um, and your response to, I don't know, whatever you're faced with um, can be anything, I suppose. Um, and it also can be, it can be lint, you know? Um, yeah. You know, it doesn't just come naturally. It definitely doesn't come naturally for me. Um, but yeah, so that's just my take on it. But I'm sure there's a there's a deeper a deeper um, explanation to it or meaning. Thanks, Greg. Can can I go? Sure, see. Um, I think I, if I might just add, I think it's also she mentioned something so important. It's how you it's how you respond to respond to, to stimuli, yeah. you know, to to everything around you, um, in a way that benefits you, but also is not harmful to to the people that you're responding to so i think it's, it's a whole range of things absolutely i think to me it's always just be i, I see awareness but it's also awareness of how you respond and receive certain things i've always yeah. wanted to know exactly what it entails and that's always how i just perceived it is how you respond to certain things that trigger your emotions or how mm. you react to certain things mm. Yeah, that's great. I think I have a basic understanding of self-awareness, motivation, empathy, and social skills, a very basic understanding. But the one that got to me was self-regulation. Mm -hmm. No idea what that is. So I'm hoping to learn something more about that. Hi, ladies. I'm Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Um, I think... Yeah, I think like it covers like, it's a lot like just on past um experience, and I know from I've worked in different like institutions, and everyone has a different take on it. So for me, it was also a lot about what you know with regards to religion, culture, mm. like where you come from. So I found that to be also like a portion of what emotional intelligence yeah that's a really great point actually um and i think you there, there's definitely some common themes that um that all of you have identified and hopefully through this session we're going to unpack a little bit more the difference between responding and reacting to something um and also, what does it mean to self-regulate um, your emotions? And Sia said something, you know, about not being harmful in how we treat others or how we maybe express those emotions. And, um, you know, Greshna was also saying that it can be learned. Um, I've had to work on my EQ. I must say that naturally, um, I probably have very low EQ. So it really can be learned, um, you know, across your lifespan and religion and culture, your background, your upbringing has a lot to do with how you develop your EQ, because we, we learn from those around us. So, um, you know, the way that we were brought up, there might be certain cultural beliefs as well that have been really embedded um, into our personality or our upbringing from a really young age. Um, so there's a lot of different things that make up EQ and EQ is one of those, um, it's almost one of those buzzwords that you hear in corporate culture a lot, right? So you'll hear um, especially HR professionals, OD professionals, um, you'll hear it to, you know, in the exec team a lot, they'll say EQ, EQ, you know, it's really important for leadership and it's important for management and it, it absolutely is. Um, but today we're also going to discuss for you as an individual for you know your life your relationships your friendships your family what does it actually mean to be emotionally intelligent and how can we actually improve this as well so eq has um, four main components or four main elements and there's so many different theories out there um, different takes on it and it keeps on evolving um, there's some theories where you know, motivation is, is kind of added as well as a fifth element to EQ as well. But broadly speaking, it consists of these four um, core components. And the self-awareness is really about how aware you are 
of how you think and how you feel in any given moment, right? So are you able to notice things like your mood changing? So your mood going up and down. Um, are you able to evaluate how you feel? So if I had to ask you how you feel in this moment, would you be able to give me an answer or a description, a feeling word as to how you feel in this moment? So the self-awareness is all about, it's, it's very much the internal, it's the looking inward and saying, this is how I think, feel in this moment. And it's about noticing that as it's coming on. So I can feel myself getting angry, can feel myself getting anxious. So being able to notice those changes in your emotional climate is what that self-awareness um, component really speaks to. So the social awareness is very similar, but it's what we notice about people. So when we're looking at social skills, it's how do we have that social awareness of others? So if I'm in a conversation with somebody else, um, do I have empathy? Am I able to listen? Am I able to connect with what that person is saying? And do I have that understanding around me of um, you know, my environment and, and what's going on around me? So if I'm sitting in a room alone and you know, someone walks in, Am I able to notice that? Am I able to, um, you know, almost be able to say to myself, why is that person here? You know, is it a friend? Is it a family member? Is it a stranger? And it's that basis really of our shared humanity um, in, in having that social awareness of those around us. And the social skills um, is really how that is expressed with others in the environment. So you often hear people saying, oh, that person has got no social skills, right? So um, you, you can talk about people and um, people say, oh, you know, for example, Joanne's got no social skills. And what do they actually mean by that? What they mean is that either that self-awareness or that social awareness isn't there, and that is demonstrated in how those social skills manifest themselves. So that social skills is knowing the appropriate time to say things. So when to speak, when not to speak, when to say appropriate things or, or, or not say appropriate things. Um, and it's about being able to form those connections and form those bonds with people around you. And that doesn't come naturally to everybody. Um, so you might notice that people, when they're put into a social setting, it makes them very nervous. It makes them anxious. They don't know what to say to other people. They might blurt out random things because they're not really sure how to connect with others. Um, or they might say something that's completely inappropriate to another person that's maybe standing in front of them. So it's how do we actually demonstrate that social awareness, that empathy, those relationships, and how does that actually come out of our mouth and, um, and our actions? So another important part of that is being able to read body language, right? So if you're in a conversation with someone, you should be able to see, um, is that person angry? Are they annoyed? Are they upset? Are they agitated? Is this the right time to, to speak to them? Um, and, and this is something that you, you can become very in tune with if you're able to train yourself to pick up on those cues in body language. Um, so for example, I used to work with someone who, um, I knew that if this person's vein was kind of throbbing on the side of their head, not the time to talk to them at all. Turn around, walk away. <laughs> it's not going to happen. You're not going to get that document signed. You're not going to get that contract signed today. Just turn around and walk away. So that's being able to pick up on those subtle kind of cues that someone else's body language can tell you. Um, or you have people, for example, in interviews as well, that they just talk and talk and talk and talk and the interviewer goes, you know, just cool it, hold on for a minute. And they just keep going because they're not able to actually read that cue coming from that other person that's saying, you know, just stop or stop talking. So that's a really great example of social skills. And something that I just want to say as a caveat to that as well is that when you go out there and you interact with people, um, it's important to understand, like we said in the beginning, that not everyone has the same level of um, you know, social awareness and social skills. 
and sometimes it's not um, it's not on purpose and it's it's not malicious at all. So you get people, um, unfortunately, that have things like personality disorders um, or they have certain learning conditions like Asperger's um, or um, Tourette's. Um, there's a whole you know spectrum of different conditions where people aren't able to naturally pick up on those cues in the environment and those social cues. So always be um, empathetic to that as well. Um, so self-management, the, um, the last component and um, something that kind of was touched on earlier on as well. So the self-management is really, um, it's the self-awareness, the social awareness and the social skills kind of all brought together. But this is really how we self-regulate our emotions. So um, my mom said earlier on self-regulation, she doesn't know what that means. So when we talk about self-regulation, it's, so I feel the emotion coming up, right? I feel the anxiety, the irritation, the anger coming up. So I notice it. So I have the self-awareness, but now what am I going to do about that emotion? Um, am I going to go and stab somebody because I'm that angry? Um, am I going to go and sit and sob and cry about it for, you know, a few hours because I'm that frustrated or am I going to just do nothing and pretend that I don't feel that way and that that emotion doesn't exist so the regulation is all about how we navigate those highs and those lows right so we will feel the emotion coming on some of us not all of us <laughs> will feel the emotion coming on and emotions bold and bold right and sometimes they can erupt and it's kind of like that that pressure cooker analogy where it, it, it can build and it can build and you can just snap because you just can't contain anymore or you've kept it in and then all it takes is for someone to make one comment to you and there the whole lid flies off and everything comes out so when we talk about self-regulation it also comes back to um, what Sia very importantly said earlier on is do we self-harm others with our emotions and how we express and regulate our emotions but another thing that i really also want to say is really important in self-regulation is it's not always about other people it's not always about how you make others feel am i hurting other people's feelings am i offending other people what about you as well and and that that's also um something i'll touch on later around self-compassion as well is when you feel those emotions, just because you're not expressing them or you're not taking them out on somebody else doesn't mean that you're regulating those emotions in a healthy way. So I, I've, I've heard of this really great analogy and there's quite a lot of um, analogies around anger and emotions. So one of them is that anger is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die, but you're only punching yourself. And another great analogy that I heard from someone else in my life is that when you hold on to negative emotion, it's you're so angry or you're so upset about a situation and you basically take a knife and you stab yourself with those negative emotions, thinking that you're punishing the other person, but instead you're actually just stabbing yourself with that knife. Um, so you're using all of those negative emotions and you're turning it inward to yourself rather than expressing it out there. So what we're gonna discuss um, in, in a couple of minutes is I'm gonna take you through some scenarios um, to kind of depict in a, in a bit more of a fun way as to how those emotions can um, manifest themselves in different scenarios as well. So I'm gonna give you one scenario right but four different ways of dealing with the scenario and then i'm going to ask you questions afterwards so. <laughs> so keep track of the details okay so in scenario one um and i just had to go with this picture i'm sorry i, I just needed this picture <laughs> um i just love the ice cube kind of attitude um so let's say you're at work and you're about to, to pick up your bag and, and head out for lunch. And as you are 
just packing up your stuff, you know, and, and heading out for lunch, you encounter two of your colleagues in the passage. And these aren't colleagues that you're really close with, you know, they work in a different department, it's not colleagues that you kind of talk to on a, on a daily basis, but you know, you make small chit chat with people at work and you know, you're always friendly. And so these top two colleagues are standing there and one of them says to you, oh, you look really, really tired today. Okay. So there's you standing and you're on the receiving end of that comment. Okay. So in this scenario, in scenario one, you say to that person in front of you, whether I'm tired or not is none of your business. It's got nothing to do with you, whether I'm tired or I'm not tired, mind your own business. Okay. So that's scenario one. Just remember that one. Scenario two, exactly the same scenario, but when you're in that situation and that person says to you, you look tired, you smile and you say nothing and you say, actually, I'm, I'm heading out for lunch now. Or you just say, okay, and you carry on. But no, you don't go out to lunch. You go to the toilet and you sit and you cry for five minutes. And now you start saying to yourself, I'm so ugly. Um, People are saying that I look tired, I'm not good looking, I've got a tired face. And now that one comment that was made to you now has morphed itself into a whole string of different comments. And there's you sitting on the toilet in number two crying for a few minutes. And then off you go to lunch with your, you know, your puffy eyes and your red nose. And you carry on like nothing happened. And off you go and you get your lunch. So scenario three is you stand there, you hear the comments, you don't think anything of it at the time, you don't say anything, you say, oh, okay, uh, yeah, I'm going out for lunch now, I'll see you guys around. And off you go, you go out for lunch, you carry on with your day as if, you know, this comment is inconsequential, it's neither here nor there. And you come home from work and there you are, you're preparing, um, a meal for you and your family and you're chopping up some onions and chopping up some vegetables but my word are you chopping those onions up um you are just chopping those onions like your life depends on it um and you're chopping and you're chopping and you're chopping and your daughter says to you why are you chopping those onions so violently you know um you, you look like you're gonna break the board because you just chopping these onions in such a way that is surprising. It, it seems unwarranted. <laughs> and so there you are chopping your onions and you say, I don't know, actually, um, I don't know why I'm chopping the onions like that. I just, you know, I just feel like it. That's just what I feel at the moment. So that's scenario three. Scenario four is you in the conversation, the person says to you, you look tired. You say, oh yeah, actually I'm tired today probably or Oh, okay, cool. And off you go and you carry on with your day. You don't think anything about it. You don't read into it. Um, doesn't, doesn't matter to you. It's just the comments by two people that aren't close to you, don't really know them that well. And off you go and you carry on with your day. So when I put those four scenarios to you, right? If I say to you, which one of these scenarios or two of these scenarios resonates the most with you and with your lived experience where do you identify yourself in those four scenarios that i've just described um i'll go um, i think i'm definitely a one and a two one and a two and i think it depends on who's saying um, mm -hmm. what is being said mm -hmm. so if it's random colleagues that I hardly hear I'll give them a one but if it's if it's somebody that's rather you know has a part in my life then I'll consider it and it will hurt my feelings but I'm not one to quickly express it to them so in in in, in the place of of colleagues that I'm randomly you know you know I randomly know I'll give them a one and I'll tell them where to get off <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> Okay. <laughs> cool. Anyone else want to go? Um, I'll, I'll go. 
Oh, now go, Rivka. Hi, Rivka. Oh, um, so I think I'm between a three and a four. Um, I think on a good day, I'll be a four. Mm. Not so good day, I might find myself fixating on it a bit later, like I, as the day winds down. Mm. So, um, there's like, like, and with, with those self doubting kind of questions, like, what do they mean? What is there something wrong with me? Um, yeah. What's the factor? Like that kind of a, yeah, between the three and the four. I'm between a one and a four, so it depends, because I speak to everybody wherever I go, it depends on who you are, so depending on who you are, I might tell you, excuse me, mind your own business, or number four, again, if you're relevant, or if you are someone I know, and this person might know that I've, I've be, I haven't been sleeping, or I've been going through things, and they tell me I'm tired, I'll be like, mm -hmm. but I am tired, Thanks or whatever. So I'm, I'm definitely between a one and a four, depending on who it is and what the situation is. So. I'll allow anyone else a chance if they want to weigh in, otherwise we can move on. Cool, okay. So with the four scenarios, right, if you think about what characterizes those different four scenarios, so if you had to think about putting a label onto how that person was in each scenario, what would you label each of those? So for the um, ice cube picture, what do you think was the, the kind of method of how emotions were expressed or had in that scenario. And I'll give you a clue, it was something we said earlier on, it was something actually that Joe said at the beginning of the session. Um, um, okay, this is now in, in my very tiny opinion. I think when I am performing one, I'm protecting thyself. Yeah. So I'm putting number one first, which is me. So I think I think I it's, it's it, I don't know how to phrase it, but it's definitely a protection of self. <laughs> so I'm not letting yeah. exterior things come in. You know, I'm, I, I know exactly what to take in and what not to take in, and from who to take it from. So I don't know how you would phrase that. Yeah, and that's that's exactly it. I think you've actually described it beautifully. It's actually reacting to the situation rather than responding, but it's a defensive mechanism, right? So when we feel attacked or we feel that something is not appropriate or it's not, you know, not someone's business, our number one goal there is to protect ourselves. So the the, the first scenario is it's very much a reaction to the situation and it's a defense mechanism. And you could say that it comes off as quite defensive in kind of the nature of how that interaction happens. Um, with scenario two, how would you characterize scenario two? That would be like self-doubt, like there you're not even, you can't even react, you immediately just attack and you take in and you explode because you are immediately reacting to what this person was saying mm -hmm. and you're not mm -hmm. responding. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we've also said it earlier on, it's, it's that kind of, that self-doubt that creeps in, that negative self-talk, that insecurity, that you then go and punish yourself actually because someone else made a comment um, and in the moment you're not going to say anything you're just going to smile and grin but then two minutes later you you're crying about it um, so it has definitely affected you on some level and what about um scenario three topping the onions breaking the board I think with this one, um, it's actually just not dealing with it at all. So you're pushing it aside and mm -hmm. it's coming out in another way. 
So especially at work, if you're not dealing with something in the workplace or any area of your life, it tends to um, come up in another area in your life. So I feel like number three represents that a bit. And then it might happen in the next week. It might actually just escalate and only happen in six months time and you have like a breakdown or something. Yeah. So I feel like it's not really dealing with the emotion. It's just pushing it to side to deal with something else. That is so 100% accurate. Um, number four, what do we think of number four? I don't know how to label it, but number four is really not taking to heart what someone else is saying. Like it's yeah. water off your back. Mm -hmm. It's just, that's your opinion. Oh, well, thank you. And we move on. It's really just not letting what the, what the person's saying get to you at all. Uh, I think that also speaks to, if, if I just use myself in the scenario, it's, it's being comfortable in my skin. And like I said, if I am tired, it's okay, but it doesn't matter that you said it. So I think, yeah, that's not taking to heart anything this person. Yeah, it's kind of that not, um, not reacting um, and responding maybe in a healthier way, you know, um, you being able to move on and, and not take it to heart, not read too much into what we said. So with the four scenarios, and I think you've You've all reflected kind of on where you see yourself within those four scenarios. Which one of the four scenarios do you think is the most self-compassionate toward yourself? Um, Amy, when you I've say self-compassionate, can you elaborate sure. more or maybe so, word it differently? I'm not sure I understand. So in the four, um, scenarios which one do you think is the most loving toward yourself which you think is the most healthiest of the four um i think four yeah definitely yeah, four. Four. um would you choose do you have to choose one <laughs> Well, no, you don't have to choose one because I think, like we said earlier on, it, it really depends on the situation and mm. the circumstance and who it is and whether that person has kind of, you know, a seat at the table in your life or in your emotions. And um, so you might vary between, you know, those different ones. I'm definitely never, never a one. I don't usually, I think, react to stuff. Um but if I was being robbed in the street, you know, <laughs> I think one would certainly come out, you know, if someone was, you know, annoying me or begging or whatever, I think one would definitely come out. But if I'm in a normal day-to-day -day scenario, um, I would certainly want to be a four. That's what I would, um, I guess, aspire to always be is kind of like a four, where I know that I've not, I've not reacted kind of off the bat to the situation. And I've responded if I've needed to, but I've responded in a way that's been self-compassionate to myself where I've not gone off and punished myself because of a comment that someone else has made, or I'm not there, you know, picking a fight with my husband when I get home from work because of something that was said to me, you know, five or six hours ago by someone else and now expressing myself through that channel. So for me, I'd kind of, I think, aspire to be a four most of the time and another thing i just wanted to ask is because it's depicted in um depicted in both scenario two and three is do you guys know the difference between suppressing emotions and repressing emotions um so amy that's what i was just about to ask like is it possible that um that two and maybe even three could also be a a what did you call it self what now um <laughs> what uh suppression uh, or repression no the what you talk compassion 
self compassion um like could could it be possible that two or three could also be instances of self compassion if you like okay this is how i feel in this moment so i'm going to go to the bathroom and just release and deal and then carry on and maybe maybe i don't know i'm kind of iffy with we'll see depending on how the person feels after chopping those onions <laughs> like <laughs> i think it's yeah. seen <laughs> Could I think it's like a way of honoring your your emotions, like you like you mentioned. I think that you ask a really important question, and thank you for actually asking that question because we need to unpack this and we need to explore it. I think a little bit more to really understand how that can play out and 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 what that could look like from a self compassion point of view. So in number two, I think that sometimes we need to release emotions right um and sometimes you are so sad that you cry um or maybe you're a sensitive person so it doesn't take much for you to cry or you know to be upset by something but so the expression of it is fine right no problem it's healthy to express and it, coming back to what we said earlier on expression in the sense of us not self harming other people or you know taking that out on other people but when that self expression becomes a i'm now going to roast any smirk because of that comment that's not compassionate so if i'm sitting on the toilet and i'm crying because i'm i'm genuinely hurt by that person making that comment that's fine i'm crying i'm releasing it you know 5 minutes time i can get up and i can move on But if I'm sitting there and I'm saying you're useless, you're worthless, um, you need to dress better, you need to look better, you should have put more makeup on, you should have slept more, do you see how I'm going down this kind of rabbit hole or of self-negative talk? And I'm going to feel so much worse when I get up from that toilet versus if I had maybe gone for three or four. But in three, it's so I think coming back to my question around. suppressing and repressing so two is a classic example of suppressing because suppressing is when you feel the emotion but you push it out right you say to yourself i can't cry now because i'm sitting in front of my boss um or i can't cry now because of whatever reason i don't want to show weakness i don't want to make myself vulnerable whatever so you push that out right and you allow yourself a space so you say i'm going when i get to the toilet then i can cry when i get to my car then i can cry and so that that very act of you noticing it but you're pushing it out is suppression because you've moved that emotion that you need to feel now that you actually are feeling now to say i will deal with this at a later stage right so that's that's suppressing it in the moment but in number 3 Number 3 is different because number 3 is actually repressing. So in number 3 when that emotion came up during that conversation you never actually noticed it. So you maybe felt sad, you maybe felt irritated or annoyed by the comments, but you never noticed it. It just like went over your head. So now what happens is like someone said earlier on it's not been dealt with so it's going to come back. it's like a boomerang it just goes round and and round and round so it's going to come out one way or another so it's going to come out um in a few hours time in a few days time a few months time a few years time and then you can have a complete meltdown you, you know you don't know like like i said earlier on coming back to that that pressure cooker analogy right there's only so much that you can keep stuffing into that pressure cooker before it's going to explode eventually so in scenario 3 there wasn't that recognition or that acknowledgement or noticing of that emotion when it came up in the situation so now you're chopping the onions and that emotion comes up you don't know where it's coming from because it's really difficult now to connect the dots between something that happened 5 hours ago 6 hours ago so you haven't connected those dots but your body feels those emotions and your body's keeping score so there you are chopping those onions <laughs> and you're releasing it right so you're releasing it but that's good but then i ask myself the question if i was releasing it there who's to say i wasn't going to release it somewhere else in an unhealthy way so let's say i was 
getting in my car and I was driving somewhere and someone decides to overtake me and now I'm zapping that person. That's not like me. That's not my character. That's not who I am. But that emotion now has surfaced. That pressure cooker has, <laughs> has lifted the lid off. It's blown off. And there I am reacting to the situation versus actually responding to the situation. Does that kind of make a little bit more sense from like a clarity perspective of how we can suppress and repress our emotions? Cool. Thank you. Um, so just a little bit about myself as well. So in where I see myself in these four, um, four different scenarios. So I would say most of my life, I've been a two and a three. Um, and I would say I've probably been a two and a three up until maybe my mid twenties. And so either in like a number two style, I would kind of sit there in the situation and smile and, you know, tolerate it. And then I go home and cry. Um, so I go home and cry or go home and open a bottle of wine or go home and eat, you know, two slabs of chocolate, um, really just trying to bury those emotions or saying to myself, I can't deal with this right now. I can't, I'll, I'll move it for later. I can, you know, pencil this emotion for later. And I think number three, so for me, my life has mainly been, I think probably a balance between suppressing and repressing. So in repressing, there isn't that um, conscious awareness of the emotion coming up, right? So it's really difficult as well when you are so used to suppressing your emotions for most of your life that you don't realize the harmful effect that that's maybe having on other people. Um, or, you know, I, I would, something would happen to me and then four days later, I'm miserable. And I can't understand why I'm so miserable. I can't understand why I'm so down or my mood is just kind of, you know, dropped off the edge of a cliff. And it's then very difficult to go back and think, what happened yesterday? What happened the day before that? What happened the day before that? Who was I having conversations with, you know? And trying to get to that point of understanding, oh, okay, that's actually the situation that might have triggered me to now respond to this later on. So I would, I would definitely say that I've been a two and a three for most of my life. And absolutely, childhood plays a big, a big role in how we um, navigate our emotional climate as well. I think definitely for me, there's experiences that I had in, in my childhood that left me very much feeling like I couldn't trust people. Um, I didn't, you know, couldn't feel safe or kind of tr trustful around people. I would just feel constantly on edge um, or constantly that whatever people were saying to me, there was always an, another side to that coin, if that makes sense at all. Um, and those who know me really well know that I absolutely love people. Um, and the whole reason why I studied industrial psych and I went into HR really is because of my love of people, right? But at the same time that I absolutely love people, for most of my life, I was scared to death of my emotions. Um, I thought that being vulnerable was the scariest thing on earth. The fact that other people knew that I had emotions or could see that I had emotions. And I just felt really, really like I couldn't express those emotions. So it was constantly a tabling it for later situation. Um, and I really wish that what I know now about EQ and what I've kind of developed over the last, probably the last five years is I really wish that I'd known those things in kind of my preteen years or even in the beginning of my twenties, because I think that that would have helped me a lot in navigating through toxic relationships, um, boundaries, and unfortunately you don't know what you know until you know it, right? So, um, and we can always use our pain and our past experiences to better ourselves. Um, I'm not someone that believes that you can play the childhood card or play the you know past relationships card and say, 
I am the way I am because of what's happened to me in the past and I just accept that and I'm, I'm not going to try or even bother to you know change that or to do anything about it um so we can absolutely you know we can use our pain to to change our outlook on life and to change the way that we, we see things and we do things and that we respond to things um and I in my 20s had two major episodes of um of depression two two quite big episodes of um of depression and it's kind of like your body says i'm done i'm just done and i need to reboot i'm hitting the reboot button now and you literally cannot do anything you can't shower you can't brush your teeth you can't get that bed in the morning you can do absolutely nothing it's like your body just pulls the plug and says we're stopping here we're taking stock and we're not moving forward until this is done um so although those those two kind of periods of depression in my life were really hard and really challenging for me to go through i see them more as also spiritual awakenings rather than things that set me back or that i lost a lot of time to as well because I think I learned at that point in my life that the way that I was dealing with my emotions really wasn't serving me and it wasn't working for me. The fact that I was constantly suppressing and repressing, my body was keeping score all the time. And then I would have that meltdown six months later or a year later. And my body just got to a point where it said, I can't do this anymore. And you need to start actually listening to me start listening to those emotions, start noticing how you feel when you're feeling it, stop tabling it and penciling it in for later all the time. So um, I think I'm gonna open just for a few kind of questions, thoughts or, or comments, I think before we, we move on from this slide. So please feel free just to unmute yourselves. And um, yeah, if there's anything else that you want to kind of add to the four scenarios or anything that we've spoken about for the last couple of minutes. Amy, for me, hey, like oh. I just thought of like so many different scenarios where I could have reacted differently. And then also realizing how much trauma actually plays into the way I respond emotionally. And like you can definitely choose to respond like positively or I don't know, defensively <laughs> rather than negatively, defensively. Um, but it's it I also think it comes down to the language that you use with yourself. Mm. Um, I've realized that with myself and, and the more positive I am in terms of what I'm experiencing, then I almost respond in a better way, you know. I don't know if that makes any sense. But yeah, I yeah, just I like, had lots of like flashbacks to like memories of, of things. And I was just like, you could have done things a lot different. Can I go in? Sure. Um, for me, number one key, I really should not have said that, you know, when, when I, I think I used defense first and then empathy last. Mm. So I think as I grow older, I'm, I'm starting to, to realize that. And I, and I, I, I sense, or I see it when I'm becoming defensive, I track back the conversation and I'm like, I'll reply later when I think about it, because I, I can immediately feel that, okay, I'm going to snap. <laughs> I'm going to lose it. <laughs> so I think, I think, also, it's it's how we we are brought up. A lot of a lot of um, things come back from that. You know, you mm. you always feel the need to to be competitive, to go after number one, to to look after yourself, and it, it builds up as you're growing older. And you not not that you are you are anti people, but it it, it it just it's it's a strange balance between looking out for yourself and being defensive you know because yeah. I think there's a very unhealthy thing about defense that I, I really need to deal with while I'm dealing with it <laughs> but I, I think also because I, I don't want to let go of of defending myself 
at the expense mm. of being kind to others but i also mm. want to to balance it i i always feel like okay now i'm pushing the defense side i need to come back i need to bring it back i need to bring it back so i think i think i'm i'm struggling to get to number 4 leaving mm. number 1 <laughs> And that's good that you know that and it's good that in itself is a gift that you're able to reflect and say you know what I'm a number 1 but I want to be a 4 or in the situation you can say to yourself okay hang on I'm going to I'm going to put the brakes here and instead of responding to you know this message or this you know actually reacting to this person and being defensive Let me just cool down for you know a few minutes, a couple of hours, and then I will respond to you. And I think that in itself, it kind of shows that you've done a bit of work around it already, and that this is this is a conversation that you're obviously having with yourself already. To say, um, I might I might kind of be more going toward the side of defensive here. So let me just pause or. actually you know what this is an area that i really need to actually work on for myself and remembering that empathy and maybe unlearning some of those beliefs that you learned through childhood where you were told to be competitive or you were told to always you know put yourself first or that not to trust anybody or you know all those things that kind of come up in your situations as well so i think that that in itself is a gift I I sometimes overthink things way too much. So it could either be a case of oh my goodness what did I say or oh my god these people probably think I reacted completely stupid or whatever and then at the other time and in a different instance when I defend myself when I have to defend myself mm-hmm. I now feel bad for defending myself mm-hmm. or you'd say something that's not appropriate um and I address it um it also depends on the situation before i address it but then i'm going to feel bad for having addressed or standing up for myself so if, or if someone wants asks me something and i don't necessarily want to agree i feel bad now for saying no and then also number 3 my family and my husband are always the onions and the veggies my poor husband is the punching bag of something someone did during the day so sometimes i could i said i'm number 1 and 4 but i could also be a 3 in the sense of if it, the minute i start talking about it and it takes he, he just needs to say one wrong word mm. then he becomes that onion and then i take all that frustration out on him you didn't do shit. anything the poor soul yeah. but now yeah. he's on the receiving yeah. end yeah yeah and i'm aware <laughs> aware of it but it's often times he is my onion mm. which isn't fair and so it also really depends again on what it is and the situation mm. that i could also need i could also leave it there and something would trigger it and then i would explode and it's always in yeah um yeah i'm just to add i think to that um you are know, like so i think it's i think it's so hard like if you've got certain characteristics and the way you grew up but i think for me personally because i've been on this journey for a long time so um I I find it sometimes just tiring trying to discover that self awareness and trying to figure out how to deal with your emotions and then you still need to consider other people's emotions. Yeah. So this is just something that I I think in the last 2 to 3 years because I like I think I became such a cry baby in the last 3 years because I was just the toilet girl I think for like a year or two ago I was just the toilet girl all the time. because i felt bad and i was like oh they keep saying this but i think what what i'm learning now is that that self key is going to come with a certain type of defense and people are not going to like it and i think that was the hardest part because you're going to let people down you're going to lose people in your life because of this journey of self awareness mm-hmm. so like that has come through i think in the last 2 years for me the most because that is a journey part of my self awareness that I'm on now. Yeah. So and you yeah, you can't think... please everybody. You 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 no. can't please everybody and when you start to actually change yourself and you shift and you start putting those boundaries in place and those healthy boundaries that say I'm not going to let you kind of walk over me or I'm not going to let you push me to that place where I'm later on chopping onions because of something that you've said. 
is people notice that and they then start reacting to that. And um, it actually also shows you who in your life is really there because they genuinely care about you or who in your life has actually benefited from those lack of boundaries that you've had in the past. Exactly that. And I think that key word that you mentioned, the boundaries. And I think in some way we, we all have to have it, but it's all different boundaries, work, mm. family, relationship, kids. So I think it's, it's, yeah, it's quite interesting when it comes to the boundaries and the self-awareness and just putting that up. Yeah. And then all these, these um, icons or all these emotions come in. Because looking mm. at the four now, I was like, phew, we go from being crazy, like just... We swing, we can swing like a... <laughs> it's swing crazy. Swing between them, yeah. Exactly. Okay, ladies, I'm going to move on from the slide just for the sake of time. But don't worry, we will have our, um, our Q&A at the end as well for anything that you've missed as well. Um, so what does it actually take to feel okay. Um, so there's things in the short term, so things that we can really do in the moment, in the year, in the now, when that situation is happening. So first and foremost, like I've mentioned earlier on, is noticing how you feel. So noticing how you feel in the moment is going to prevent you from getting to that number two or that number three scenario. Um, name it, but detach from it. Um, accepting the present, music, a mantra or a prayer or call, call that friend that's there for you. Um, so just one of the ones I want to go back to naming, name it but, but detach from it, is that a lot of the time we are taught that to talk about your problems is going to make it better or is going to help you to talk about your problems. But unfortunately, the reality is that when we spend too much time talking about our problems, we actually attach more to them and we become fixated with them. So when I say name it, but, but detach from it, what I'm really saying is be general. So we all have problems, right? We're all going to experience problems. And it's fine to acknowledge that there's a problem there. But don't over explain it and talk to everybody about it that wants to listen, that you meet. Don't repeat it to multiple people multiple times because again, you're just going down that rabbit hole in um, number two that we spoke about, that, that self kind of self-doubt and that negative talk. So let's say, for example, I was, um, you know, short paid my salary in a month and I know that, okay, so I've been short paid, let's say, and I only receive half my salary this month. So that's a problem, right? I acknowledge that that's a problem and that that's going to be a problem for me. So I can say to my husband or I can say to my mother, you know what, I've been short paid my salary this month. And I can leave it there. I've acknowledged the problem. Yes, I've spoken about it. I've said it. Those who are important to me in my life, I've told about it. I didn't tell you know, my mother and my auntie and my cousin and my friend and my friend's friends and everyone. I just told two or three people that are in my tribe that are important, right? But now if I go to my mother and I say, you know what, I was short paid this month. I'm not going to be able to pay my rent. I'm not going to be able to pay my car payment. I'm going to be really stressed out about this. It means I'm not going to be able to get to work for the rest of the month. It means that I'm not going to be able to buy food. It means that I'm going to need to loan money from someone. Do you see how that in itself is leading me down a, ra a rabbit hole where I'm just attaching more and more to that problem that I have? So that's, a, that's kind of a classic example of what I mean when I say name it, but don't become overly attached and fixated with it. Um, accepting the presence is also really important. Don't fight it. Don't fight your emotions. If you feel it, you feel it. There's nothing wrong with feeling and emotion, right? And when you're in a moment and you feel really, you know, down, or you just feel, you just feel like you need your mood kind of to be lifted, maybe after you've interacted with a certain person. Music is a really great way just to get yourself up there quickly. So whatever your favorite music is, whatever your favorite playlist on Spotify is, if you're having a bad day, put that on. And that's just an immediate way to kind of get those emotions up very quickly and it's not harmful to 
yourself or to anyone else and it's it's a quick fix um, a mantra or prayer as well is something that you can do in the moment and something that you can think of at the time so i know there's a lot of people um on the call that might be religious or you know have spiritual beliefs um that that really are it's their faith that actually keeps them going and, and keeps them able to kind of sustain themselves in a healthy way through a lot of situations so one of my um favorite mantras that i use is that um when i'm dealing with the, the person is i'll say to myself everyone deserves a life free of suffering so just as much as i don't want to suffer that person that's treating me badly or that has said something to me that i don't like also deserves a life free of suffering so by me trying to punish them or make them suffer is not even in the score it's just making me suffer and them suffer as well so we all des deserve a life free of suffering my other one is um, compassion is a relationship between equals so in the kind of work that i do um you know there's there's people that come to me often with problems they you know they have a grievance they aren't being treated fairly by the manager and so they're coming to me with problems all the time <laughs> And it's very easy to get into a place where you can feel superior to someone else because you're helping them through a problem, right? You're in a helping relationship. But I always say to myself, compassion is a relationship between equals. So even though this person is coming to me with a problem, it doesn't mean that I am better than them because I'm helping them through this problem. No, I'm only demonstrating my compassion to them by acknowledging and seeing where they are in order to help them through that situation. So a life of emotional independence, when we speak about getting to that number four place, a life of emotional independence is one where my mood and my happiness are, are not products of circumstance or conditions, but they are my own design. So rising to the challenges that I set for myself, not the challenges that other people set for me, is so much better because then I'm not people pleasing. And I'm not saying that, you know what, in order to be a really great person, in order to be happy, I first need to get married, or I first need to make a million, or I first need to buy a house, or I first need to have a baby, and then I'm going to be happy. So emotional independence is I'm happy here now, and it's because of my creation, not because of the circumstance outside of myself that probably I can't even control anyway. So that's what um, emotional independence is, um, is all about. And there's things that we can do in the long term as well to really build that capacity for emotional independence over time. So you mentioned it earlier, someone, someone spoke about that self-care. So self-care techniques, um, you know, getting enough sleep. We all know the importance of nutrition, you know, eating properly, doing things like yoga, um, mindfulness practices, really making sure that we know that our body is important and with our body as well our emotions are important so it's no good just you know eating right and exercising but what are the other things that we're doing really to kind of recharge ourselves and, and get connected with others so skills exchange is a brilliant opportunity for us to connect with other women and to kind of nourish ourselves in the knowledge that we're able to share and exchange with others um boundaries as well boundaries so important um, and we're going to talk about that as well in a in a minute being able to say no and say no without justifying so no because xyz did, did. no just no <laughs> i can't do it and who deserves that explanation people in your tribe i think if i'm if i had to be saying no to my mom or I had to be saying no to my husband i'd be saying you know no because you know i'd really like to but da 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 da, da. If it's a person off the street that's asking me for five rand, I'm just gonna say no. I'm not gonna to explain to them why I can't give them five rand, right? So it's that understanding who deserves to know more about you and who deserves access to you and who doesn't, right? And then there's other ways to do that as well. Those regular self check-ins. So I think I've sent them to Stacy a, a couple of times as well. Is you know when you struggle like. I've struggled as well in the past with knowing my emotions and where I am in relation to my emotions. It's being able to have that check-in and say, okay, today's Tuesday, this is how I feel. 
I feel this way, I forgive this person, I release this, my goals for this week are this, and this is what I'm going to be focusing on that week. Then on the Sunday again, I can relook and say, okay, so on Tuesday I felt quite anxious, but today, Sunday, I'm feeling relaxed, you know, I feel a lot better, I've, you know, released, I've, you know, done some meditation or read a really good book. And I've used those self-care techniques to kind of also shift the dial of my emotions. Um, and the last one I want to talk about here is prioritizing according to self-compassion. So this one is, has got to be my favorite, I think, out of all of them. And this is actually something that I learned from um, the amazing Brene Brown, which I'm a, a huge fan of her work and her research around you know, shame and resilience and just how we become better people and embrace our imperfections as well. Um, so prioritizing according to self-compassion completely um, revolutionized the way that I dealt with my finances because I used to be someone that had a budget spreadsheet, um, that had you know all these different lines in my budget spreadsheet for all the different eventualities that could happen. You know, what if my car breaks down? What if I need a new battery? What if I need a new tire? I need this insurance, I need that insurance. And this budget was so detailed and it was so long that every cent that I actually had was mapped to something, was allocated to something, to an expense that I believed to be important. And that's because that's how I was raised. I was raised to always say, to always have a bad budget, have a plan A, have a plan B, if something breaks, you need to be able to fix it, have a spare, you know, all those things that were really entrenched into my self-beliefs. And then what would happen is I'd walk in, the, I'd walk in a mall and I'd see a dress that I really like. And I'm like, wow, you know, I really like that dress. No, I can't afford it. I can't afford that dress because, um, I've got all these other things in my budget that I've got to pay for this month. And I would then deny and suppress myself of, of having that dress because I'd say to myself, uh, I can't have that dress because I've paid an extra 200 in my car this month or, you know, whatever. So I would constantly be in that cycle of suppressing something that came up in the moment. And then when I actually looked at my finances, I said, where actually am I enjoying the money? that I work so hard for everyone. Where am I actually saying, you know what, this is my time to actually sit back and have a bit of fun. It wasn't factored into that budget at all. So prioritizing according to self-compassion list really helped me because I said to myself, what's gonna make me feel better in this moment? What's gonna make me feel better now, but in a year's time? So if I'm standing in the store and I really, really like that dress and I might not see a dress like that again, is that really, going to be self-compassionate toward myself or is buying extra 30 rolls of toilet paper this month going to be better for me and weighing up those two and making that decision so i'm not saying go off on every whim and you know everything you see buy it and you want it because you know we can all get there very quickly but it's having that balance between what is really actually compassionate and loving toward myself the hard-earned money that i've worked for versus me just believing that I need to have all these things in my budget to be a successful adult and, you know, to run a household and, you know, and all those things. So um, I am going to move on as well because I'm, I'm conscious of time and I, I want us to have some time for questions as well. Um, so what makes people difficult, right? So I don't know how many of you have seen that movie, The Devil Wears Prada. I mean, that woman is an absolute nightmare, right? She's just, you know, that's all, leave. <laughs> um, and she's an absolute menace because of, you know, just the way that she talks to her employees and the way that she treats them. And what actually makes people difficult is, you know, it's the ego. It's that I'm better than you are or I deserve, you know, these things. It's communication style, just the way that sometimes people talk to us can really just rub us up in the wrong way entirely. Personality factors, you know, we all have different personalities. Um, past lived experiences, we can blame it on trauma, we can blame it on childhood, we can say, you know, because of that, that's why I'm difficult. Um, and status as well, we can think, well, um, because I'm the CEO, I deserve to treat you in this way, or because I earn more than you, or because I'm educated, I deserve to treat you in that way. And 
So when it comes to us putting in boundaries, it's asking ourselves the question, um, is this going to matter to me in a year's time or five years time? Is this really going to count? So yes, I can be upset now and I can have emotion and I can notice it and I can release it in a healthy way, but it's not going to matter in a year's time. So do I really need to take that comment to heart? But equally, if I'm not being treated right, my emotions play a very important role in flagging up to me where there's that misalignment between how I know I should be treated and what I'm actually receiving. So that comes back to that, again, that defensiveness and, and having those healthy boundaries as well. So it's also about, you know, picking your battles, but not internalizing bad treatment. And it's actually something that my mom has, has also taught me as well, is that a lot of the time when people treat you badly, it's got nothing to do with you and it's got everything to do with them. But yet we internalize it and we think it's because, you know, this person woke up today and said, I'm going to make Amy's life in misery today. <laughs> but they didn't. <laughs> you know, my, I was the last thing on their mind. I'm so low in their list of, you know, priorities. But there I am sitting in the toilet crying about something that someone said to me. So don't internalize bad treatment because most of the time it's not even about you. It's about all those other things that someone else has got going on. So... Here's a question that I want to ask you is how do you define a good relationship in your life, a good friendship, a good healthy relationship? How would you define that for yourself? I would say what? Mm -hmm. respectful, open and honest communication with boundaries <laughs> to me it's about mutual um mutual is the key word to me because do you care for me i care for you do you respect me i respect you you check in with me i check in with you um are you there for me when i need you vice versa and i think is it a mutual relationship? Are you both on the same page? Is this mm. person supporting you? Is this person setting you straight when you need to be set straight? Is it an mm. honest relationship? I mean, I think that came that mutual comes to me so easily because I think my circle consists of mutual relationships in the sense yeah. of I know who you are and the person knows who I am. So I think mutual a mutual relationship is one that's a good one. Yeah, absolutely. Also, um, to add to that, it's you feel it when you're being drained by a relationship, and I don't think it's healthy when it gets to that point. So the minute the minute it takes away something from you that you are not comfortable letting go of, then you definitely can sense that okay, this is not this is not it. To whether it be it friendship or family. It, it really it really needs not to take something from you that you can't let yes. go of. So it must always be um, feeding into you and you feeding into it. But things that are are healthy, it can't be it can't be me giving away all of this and that and this and that and feeling like nothing's coming back in. You know. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. so important. Is it's got to be equal. It's got to be two way. It's not me always giving out. And you there, you know, living your best life with my kindness and my empathy. It's got to be two way. And I think boundaries are so important because, you know, empathy without boundaries is self destruction. Um, you will just lead yourself to a place where, you know, you're giving and you're giving, but it runs dry eventually. Um, empathy without boundaries, it's not an infinite source or supply that can just keep on going. It, it needs boundaries in order to really thrive and to live. And um, boundaries as well, uh, for those of us that are mistrustful, <laughs> which I've certainly learned, is um, what do I need in order to make the most generous assumptions about you? So what are my non-negotiables that I need from you in order to make the most generous assumptions about you 
So let's take a scenario of cheating, right? Because that's just the best classic, you know, mistrustful situation. So let's say I'm not, you know, I'm dating someone, but I don't live with them. Let's say maybe we're having a long distance relationship, right? Between different countries, which did actually happen to me. My husband and I were apart for nine months. Anyway, so what, what, what boundaries do I need? What are my non-negotiables for me to feel okay about our relationship? Right. So here's my non-negotiables. When I phone you, you answer your phone. And if you can't answer your phone, you get back to me. Let's say what's reasonable within three to four hours to say why you couldn't answer your phone or we arrange another time to talk. You let me know where you are, not, you know, every minute of every day, a, you know, I'm going to the shop now, I'm going to the toilet now, I'm going to take the bin down. No, not that kind of thing, but I'm going out today, you know, whatever back at 10, back at 12, back at 2, whatever. So I know generally where you are and kind of what your movements are. Not in a psychopathic, overbearing, jealous way, but in a, you know, this is what I need in order to assume the best about you. So I know you're not out of another woman or whatever. Okay, so those are my non-negotiables. And we're going to have a FaceTime or WhatsApp call at least once a week with each other or twice a week. So that we can connect and we can have that time that's just our quality time that's dedicated to us so those are my non-negotiables so now it's easy for me to say when that person's phone is switched off for two days or i go on instagram and i see oh you were at a club last night with so and so and so and so but you told me you were at home knitting with your granny you know so <laughs> So now it's easy for me to go back and say, you know what, those boundaries have been broken because this is what I've said I needed from you as my non-negotiables for me to assume generously about you and to feel trustful. And you've not upheld those boundaries versus me having a conversation with you saying, you know what, I don't feel comfortable. I don't feel secure in this relationship, but why, you know, based on what? So having those boundaries in place makes it so easy for us to hold people accountable because we can go back to specifics and say, uh, do you remember on the 17th of January when we discussed boundaries and we discussed that these are the non-negotiables that we need in order to survive this long distance relationship. So it makes it really easy to be able to hold people accountable when you've got those boundaries that we've agreed mutually and discussed, right? Um, so, what is a good relationship? To me, it's simple. A good relationship is a mirror. So when I, let's, you know, if I, let's, let's take a friendship, for example. So I know if I play with Stacy, and um, you know what, I'm moaning about something, I'm venting about something. Um, all I need is for Stacy to be that mirror to me, right? To mirror back to me what I'm feeling. And so that I can see myself more clearly and that I can reflect on what I'm. So what I don't need Stacey to do is to say, oh, it's not really that important. Or you know what, Amy, you're so right, you're so right, you're so right. You know what, I also need her to tell me if I'm wrong as well. To put me on my place, tell me if I'm out of line, right? But I need her to mirror back to me. And that's what empathy is. It's that constant mirroring back to someone else what is already there, but not putting your own spin on it. And I think that's where a lot of us struggle in our relationships is we go to people and we want to discuss our problems, but people end up trying to solve our problems for us or they end up putting their own spin on what our problems are, which doesn't help us at all. So again, it comes back to, you know, rising to those challenges that I set for myself and so trying to solve those problems my way versus me giving over that power to you to try and solve my problems as well. So I just want to end off with my top five tips for personal effectiveness. So presence, number one, is, is not about domination. It's about vibration and it's about energy. So a lot of the time we think you know, to be someone of impact and of power, we need to get into a room and dominate the room. You know what? We need to get there and whenever a question is asked, we need to answer a question or we need to make our voice known or, you know, whoever shouts the loudest kind of gets what they want type of thing. 
it's not true. So, and it's not inclusive as well to all types of personality. So I'm very introverted, right? So I'm definitely not going to stand on my head in a room and shout about anything. But that doesn't mean that you don't know that I'm in the room because my energy and my vibration tells you that I'm in the room. My being tuned in, tapped in, kind of turned on to my environment and engaged in the conversation tells you that I'm in the room. I don't need to shout or, you know, make a big deal about my presence and the fact that I'm in the room. Authenticity as well and being the natural you, being who you are is so important because people notice when you are not being yourself. And those that know you really well will notice it even quicker. And it's painful when they come back to you and say, you know what? The way that you acted in that situation is not who you are. It's not what you are actually really like. So be the natural you. Um, you're not going to get far in life if you go into a workplace and you trade your authenticity for approval. You're going to burn yourself out. You're going to feel frustrated. You're going to feel misaligned with who you really are. Because again, it's that constant suppressing of who you really are. So don't suppress or avoid your emotions. Don't run a mile away from your emotions. Regulate them and have self-compassion because what I was saying earlier on is emotions are not about everyone else, it's about you. So yes, you cannot harm other people with your emotions and the way that you express them, but equally don't harm yourself either. Don't take that knife, pick it up and turn it inward to punish yourself because of something that someone else has done or someone else has said and people will always listen to you if you are sure of yourself you can talk the utmost amount of crap when you get into a room you know what i can sit here and tell you i'm the ceo of facebook you know if i say it convincingly and with conviction and i say it in such a self-assured way you're going to believe me you're not going to think any different because people will believe whatever you say if you say it and you're sure of yourself and it's got nothing to do with your intelligence, it's got nothing to do with your education or your background. It's all about the way that you can communicate. And again, that vibration and that energy that you give off. And it's something important to remember. I think a lot of us, we find ourselves now in a place where we, you know, we're going for a lot of interviews because we, you know, lost our jobs because of COVID or whatever the case is. And so when we go into those interviews, it's important that we are ourselves, but whatever we're saying, we need to be confident with what we're saying as well. If you say I've got five years of marketing experience, you know, if you speak about that passionately and confidently, you're so much more likely to be noticed and acknowledged. And if you just say, yeah, I've got five years of marketing experience, and, you know, so really give, your, give yourself that opportunity to use your voice because it's going to take you so much further than if you also just gloss over kind of your accomplishments and, and what you've achieved in life. Remember that you've, you know, you've worked hard to get those experience, get that experience, get those skills. So don't be afraid to you know, show off a little bit when, you, when you're in those interviews um, and showing others that you value yourself based on your boundaries as well. So don't be afraid to say no um, and don't be afraid to stop something if it's wrong or you don't agree with it or it's not in alignment with your values or your boundaries because you're only going to cause yourself less stress in the long run. So it, it comes back to kind of that developing that long-term capability and capacity for emotional independence is about also the decisions that we make in the moment that's going to benefit us in like six months time or a year's time as well. So ladies, I know I've spoken so much. <laughs> um, so I'm now going to, I'm now going to allow you time to, um, to speak and to, you know, to get in the room, to use your voices, to ask whatever you'd like to ask. Um, or just to reflect back maybe on something I've said earlier on or, or something that you want to um, ask about, please feel free and welcome. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so that I can see you all. I just wanted to Hi, say... Hi, so I'm still here. I didn't disappear. I had a few um, connection problems, so I popped in and out, but I'm still <laughs> here. I've enjoyed the session 
subtly, mm -hmm. and I wish that I was exposed to something like this when I was in my early 20s and or younger, because most of the things that were discussed here today, I actually had to learn by myself and it only came with age. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to wait till you're 60 to, 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 to learn some of these things. And I come from a place of or a belief of uh, just get over it. Whatever happens to you, just get over it. So sometimes times I'm, uh, I'm not altogether sure whether I'm avoiding and suppressing or whether I've named it and detached. Mm -hmm. So that is something that you, you learn as you go along. Mm -hmm. So thoroughly enjoyed the session. Thank you, Amy, and thank you, ladies. I think, thank you, Mom, and I think you said something there as well that's quite important is that, you know, sometimes we don't know the difference with what we're doing. Are we avoiding? Are we suppressing? Are we running? What are we doing? Um, but the way that we were raised as well is so important because a lot of the time we're raised to think we need to just get over things. Yes. And talk about your feelings and emotions. That's all wishy washy stuff. You know, we need to move on. And that's what you grow up believing and that's what you think is right. And that's what you think you need to do in order to, you know, succeed. But the unfortunate thing is that the body keeps score and all those emotions that you haven't expressed just come back in illness or, you know, conditions or, you know, they, they always come back in another way. So when we do that, we think that we are, you know, being successful and doing the right thing, because that's definitely what we've been taught. But actually, we are punishing ourselves in a way that we don't even know we are doing until maybe it's too late or a later stage in our lives. So yes, 60 is certainly not too late no. to, to start <laughs> yeah. learning things. But you guys are lucky. You don't have to wait till 60. You're already there. <laughs> what about me? I'm nearly 70. Um, Ladies, if I might else? just add, um, it, I, I, I'm so glad that I could join. I think it's, it's self-awareness and, and self-management and, and um, emotional intelligence are things that you, you will never stop learning about. I think um, at each stage of your life, you're realizing different things about yourself, different things about environments and how you need to react. So I think it's you really we will never ever stop learning about it so um, never I, I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed it you'll never arrive <laughs> so it was really great amy and i i you mentioned something about vibrations and energy and i you gave me so much calm you know and 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 i i pick up on people's energies and you gave me so much calm and i i appreciate that it's it wasn't texting you know you know there are people that you just find that are texting <laughs> Um, but this wasn't texting. I really liked it. Um, and yeah, I thank you. Thank you, Sia, for the feedback. I just wanted to say thank you so much, Amy. I learned so much. And um, the way that you articulate and explain things made it so relatable and so easy for us to just, you know, apply. And I just wanted to say what you said about our body holds the score. It's so true. We have so much ailments and stress is a real killer. And this is all just adding to that. And if we can just also, what came up for me was that whole self-compassion thing. I think like we in the school of unlearning because we've been... Mm to do so much things a certain way and so by learning all these things that do not serve us anymore we can now also with that just be able to be so much more self-compassionate to ourselves that we don't have to have this all figured out and that we've took so long to be developed now we're starting to learn different ways of showing up for ourselves and so we should have compassion for ourselves and practice this daily before we see results and not beat ourselves up when we do fall and do react instead of respond and that's been my journey is really trying to love myself through falling and getting up and pushing myself through that. So you just did such a wonderful job. So thank you. Thank you, Taya. That's, being that's awesome feedback. And I loved what you said about self-compassion and self-love. It all starts there. And I could probably do another workshop just on self-compassion and, and, and self-love because, you know, surprise, some of us didn't learn that either. <laughs> um, but um, that's a topic for another day, but that was a beautiful summary, so thank you.
Ames, you, you were talking about like social skills earlier. And I think one thing that many women outside of skills exchange and inside of skills exchange is social anxiety. Mm. And I think that is one factor that sometimes we play down, you know what I mean? And we just expect people to be so, 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 so <laughs> confident all the time. But like you said, no. earlier, not everybody is like that. I have one question. How do you recommend somebody deal with social anxiety coming into a group like Skills Exchange? Great question. Thanks, Stace. So with social anxiety, um, it's always about getting to the crux of the matter. So with any kind of anxiety, actually something that you know you can kind of reflect on for, for any type of anxiety, whether it be social or you know another kind of anxiety, is what is it that the person fears the most as a result of that social interaction? So if I come onto a webinar for skills exchange or I go to a skills exchange event, right? What am I most fearful of happening? So I get onto the webinar or I come to an event and I'm most fearful of someone walking toward me and starting to talk to me. And I don't know what to say. So Stacy walks up to me and Stacy being Stacy's like, hi, you know, welcome to Skills Exchange. We're so lucky to have you here. Thank you for joining us. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I want to die. <laughs> you know, kill me. Um, and, I, and I say, you know what? Uh, I have a black car. And you just like, mm -hmm, okay, you know, cool. Like, the, you know, you think, I don't really know what that's got to do with anything. But I'm so nervous that I don't know what to say to you. My mind's just going to pull up the first thing that I can think of. So I'm going to say, oh, it's really hot outside today, isn't it? Or, you know, actually, um, did you hear there was an earthquake the other day in Cape Town? I'm going to pull out the most random piece of information that I can find to calm myself down and make myself feel comfortable with the fact that I'm in a room with you or I'm on a webinar with you. So in understanding social anxiety, it's absolutely that empathy to not judge someone else for the way that they might react or respond in a social situation. But for that person in that situation as well, it's trying to understand what really is triggering me about the situation and making me fearful. So it might be that someone's going to talk to me I'm not going to know what to say because I don't have that social awareness or those social skills or social cues. So I'm going to mute myself for the whole call just in case I say something inappropriate or I completely misread the situation or, or, or what someone has said. Um, uh, expression my mom and I <laughs> often use is picking up stompies. You know, when you're talking to someone and they pick up stompies, my dad does it all the time. Um, you're having a conversation about one thing and someone just throws something completely random that's got nothing to do with what you're talking about. So don't be afraid of people that pick up stompies. Um, and really understand what it is that that person fears the most and try to manage that and be empathetic to that rather than walking away and, you know, then you have a conversation with, you know, Rick and you say, you know what, Tiffany was really weird, don't you think, in that webinar? Because she did this or that or um she was muted or i asked her about something she told me she had a black car you know so it's really about having that empathy to understand and put yourself in that other person's shoes to understand what could be so nerve-wracking for them to be on a platform like this or attend an event thank you i think i definitely have a picking up stompies <laughs> <laughs> syndrome. <laughs> you know what syndrome I, I have? FOMO syndrome. Fear of missing out. <laughs> if I think I'm missing out on something somewhere, I'm like, what, 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 what? <laughs> um, don't worry, we all have syndromes of some sorts here. So <laughs> don't beat yourself up about it. Um, and I have a question. Um, so something that I know that I struggle with is um, like, I, I think I'm a very empathic person. And for the longest time, I've been so but, but um, I neglect myself a lot. Mm -hmm. So recently, I think within the past couple of months, I came to the realization that okay, I need to establish a, um, a balance, you know, within 
in terms of of my empathy and how um how just how i manage myself within it and with one specific relationship i know that i have um um so i've gotten to a point where i'm now setting up boundaries you know mm -hmm. um but i'm struggling to identify if my boundary is healthy or not in the sense that am i am i setting this boundary from a place of trauma mm -hmm. or from, from a you know a whole a, mm -hmm. is it is it a is it a wholesome boundary or is it more a boundary that's set up based from a trauma that's protection mechanism, mm. a defense mechanism? And I think mm. that's a really good um, question. And it's good that you ask yourself that because some of us don't ask ourselves that question and we think we're putting in place boundaries that are actually just defense mechanisms to deflect from our trauma. So with trauma specifically, um, there's nothing wrong with acknowledging that you have that and, and owning that and that trauma in itself can lead you to put certain boundaries in place so if you've been you know for example abused in a previous relationship or whether it was emotionally you know physically or whatever you're going to make sure that you get those boundaries right you know in that next relationship and it's completely reasonable for you to do that because you know what you're gonna you're gonna put that boundary there but over time once you can see that you can trust that person and they can meet that boundary you can then start to relax that in six months time in a year's time you know in however long so there's nothing wrong with feeling the need to put that boundary there as a starting point to protect yourself from, you know, from getting hurt or from possibly having to relive that trauma again. And I think in understanding, you know, your question around how do I know that that boundary is related to, you know, if it's related to trauma or it's related to, to you know, something else is what is the outcome that I'm hoping to achieve from having that boundary in place? Because if it's control, that's trauma based, you know, we can't control everything that's going to happen to us. Um, and if I'm putting that boundary there because I want to be controlling or I think that it's giving me power or it's giving me control, you're not going to get anything out of that. But if I'm putting that boundary there because I want to assume the most generous assumption of you based on having that non-negotiable or having that boundary there, and that's a healthier thing, right? Because I'm gonna I'm gonna gain from it and you're gonna gain from it because our relationship is gonna grow and develop as a result of that boundary. Um, and boundaries are hard. I mean, I'm still learning as well with, with boundaries because I sometimes can go back to that, you know, number two place or number three place where I think it's just the easier route to just suppress it than have to deal with it at the time. But one of the, the useful tips that I also want to share with you, which I learned in, um, in mediation training, you know, when you deal with couples and, you know, couple arguments and, you know, problems that you can encounter between two people is um, it's a technique called I feel because and I'm willing to. So um, I'll kind of break that down to you, you know, in a, in a scenario to kind of demonstrate how that can play out. So let's say, um, you know, Joanne and I, we speak to each other on a weekly basis. And I haven't heard from Joanne for four weeks. And I feel so before I get into that. So this is the technique I feel because and I am willing to. Okay, so I'm going to break down each component. So I feel so that for me is the most difficult part of that sentence before I even get to anything else. So I feel so what what do I actually feel? Um, so Joanne hasn't spoken to me for four weeks. What do I feel? Uh, do I feel disappointed? Maybe. Um, do I feel sad? Do I feel hurt? Do I feel annoyed? Um, so I'm going to say, I feel sad. Okay. I feel sad that Joanne hasn't spoken to me for four weeks. Right. So I feel sad. I feel sad because, so why do I feel sad? Do I feel sad because we used to talk to each other on a weekly basis? Yeah, probably, but is that the real reason why I feel sad? Probably not. If I, if I take it one level deeper than that, 
So I feel sad because Joanne is an important person in my life. And I feel that I'm losing her because we haven't spoken to each other for four weeks. That's the, that's the real reason for that sadness. You know, that's the kind of, you know, it's such that heart level where that's actually the crux of why I'm really sad. So I'm not going to give Joanne some, you know, highfalutin intellectual reason about why I'm sad. Oh, I'm sad. You know, we used to talk weekly. No. Why am I really sad? I think I'm losing you, Joe. Okay. So I feel sad because we haven't spoken for a number of weeks. And I feel really sad about this because we used to speak weekly, but I'm really scared that I'm losing you as a friend. And that there isn't a place for me in your life anymore because you've been too busy or maybe you've been preoccupied and maybe I feel a bit forgotten and a bit neglected, right? So I feel because. So what am I willing to do to fix this situation or to make this situation work? So first of all, I can I could be wrong. I could be completely wrong about the situation. Joanne might have lost the phone. Okay, and I don't know that. So yeah, I am going guns blazing, maybe. <laughs> like Sia said earlier on, I'm in defensive mode. I'm like, Joanne, you haven't spoken to me for four weeks. How dare you? We're supposed to be tight. Meantime, Joanne lost the phone and I'm completely on the wrong, got the wrong end of the stick. So um, so I'm gonna say, you know what, I feel willing to admit if I'm wrong. I feel willing to, you know, open up if I completely misread the situation. And I feel willing to hear you out. Um, and I feel willing for us to discuss this on the phone. Because if I'm going to wait for your text response to me, and then we're going to get into a back and forth about this, I'm willing to pick up the phone and phone you tomorrow at nine o'clock and we can talk about this. Or I'm willing to meet you for breakfast next week or whenever you might be free. I'm willing to wait until you are free to talk to you, right? So now I've built that, I feel because, and I'm willing to. So when Joanne comes back to me, I know that I've made it clear to Joanne how I feel, why I feel that way, and what I am willing to do to keep this relationship with Joanne. So that Joanne feels that I'm not attacking her I am not blaming her because I don't know why she hasn't spoken to me. I can't assume that. So do you see how that's different to me going in guns blazing, attacking her and saying, you know, you haven't spoken to me because I don't know what's going on in Joanne's life. Um, and the whole point is that I want to know. So getting to a point where I am back in, in that constant loop of communication with her, I'm not going to get there by attacking her. So that's just a really good um, technique that I learned in, in mediation in, in trying to get two people to a common goal is that what we spoke about earlier on is about equal. So I put 50 in, you put 50 in. And the minute that I feel I'm doing 60, you're doing 40, we need, you know, we need to talk about that. But in getting to that 50-50 place, this is what I am willing to do. And Equally, I want you to come back and say, this is what I'm willing to do. So Joanne might come back and say, oh, you know what, Amy, I'm so sorry. Don't take it personally. I was made redundant at work. You know, life has been hectic for me. My daughter was sick. You know, she might come back and say, but I'm, you know, I'm really sorry that we haven't spoken over the last couple of weeks. You know what, I'll call you tomorrow morning. Let's have a, a WhatsApp call tomorrow morning. Problem solved, guys. <laughs> problem solved. We didn't need to murder each other, wrestle each other to the ground, attack each other, fight each other, be defensive, sit on the toilet and cry about it. We, we, we shortened that whole emotional response to get to the resolution that we wanted at the end. Amy, I love that. I wish I had that in my 20s because I always used to be like, why aren't you talking to me? And why am I was the one doing, doing, doing? I love what you just said. And also the older you get, your priorities change. And so, you know, we also get to a point where we understand. But I have a question though, because I love this approach and I'm going to use it going forward if I'm ever faced with this. But what if I'm always the one willing to? So, I, so we haven't spoken in three weeks, but it happens every now and then. But you never reach out to me or... 
even if it's a different situation, what if what if you always the one willing to say we 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 haven't spoken, but it's because we now both have kids, and you know work is hectic, or you know when life gets busy. But how do you handle when you're always the one willing to? Whatever. Oh. Yeah, it's a oh, difficult one. You know what? <laughs> it's so tough because it actually just reminds me so much of my own lived experience. You know what? I used to be one of those people that thought you know i lived in this fantasy <laughs> ideal world where i thought my friends from high school were going to be my friends for the rest of my life um my friends from university are going to be friends for the rest of my life you know what they're going to be my wedding they're gonna you know all those things and i had this idea that when i finished school and university my friends and i were going to have in my fantasy world like a wine club you know and every week, <laughs> every week we were gonna go to a different person's house, and we were just gonna we were just gonna drink wine and eat cheese, and we were gonna watch Netflix or Bry whatever. And 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 this was we were gonna do this from the time we finished school till we were eighty and we died, you know, whenever we died. That that's literally what I believed was possible, until life happened. You know, people got married, they had kids. I'm in a different country to all of my friends. So that's quite a big obstacle to overcome. Um, and people moved in with their, you know, their partners, people moved towns, you know, people, and we all ended up being scattered all over the place. And the reality is that I probably speak to my friends maybe once a month, if that. I speak to my mom probably, yeah, if, like I speak to my mom every single day. I speak to people, friends that I've made here in England probably every week but my my best friends you know the people that grew up with me that I've known my whole life I probably speak to like once a month if that and I used to be someone that used to self-manage sorry not self-manage manage relationships until someone pointed it out to me and they said to me Amy you're managing your relationships relationships shouldn't be a career on their own so I would, I would put a note in my diary, you know, to say on the 4th of October, I need to send you Anne a message, you know, I would pencil it into my diary. And then I would, I would, you know, each week in my diary, I'd have all these messages, talk to Joanne, phone Stacy, invite Rivka for breakfast, you know, blah, 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 put all the stuff in my diary. And then I realized, hang on, why am I the only person doing this? Why am I the only person that cares? Why am I the only one always sending WhatsApp messages, always calling, always sending, you know, voice notes? And I decided to sit back and, and it's, it's something interesting that you should try. Sit back and see who chases you and see who really cares about you. Because when I stopped penciling in all those appointments and all those messages to myself to message this one and message that one, some people I never heard from ever again, like period, ever, never heard from them again. Or I heard from them, you know, now and then. And I said to myself, don't be that bitter number one person that's going to say, oh, you're talking to me now, are you? <laughs> oh, you're messaging me now after six months. You didn't even ask me how I moved country. You didn't even ask me how that went, you know, whatever. Being defensive about it. And I had to say to myself, don't take it personally that other people have their own lives as well. You know, don't take it personally that that person has, you know, moved on. They've got kids. They, they're busy. They're busy. Don't take it personally because you're busy too. And when you try to hold other people to your own expectations to which you hold yourself to, it becomes really difficult because you think to yourself, yeah, but I would message that person or I would phone them because you have, I mean, you have been doing it, but they're not going to do the same for me, but that doesn't make them a bad person or a person that is less worthy of my time or relationship with me. So it comes back again to kind of not taking things too personally and taking things to heart. Those people that really belong in your life will make an effort to be in your life. And whether you hear from them, I have friends that I hear from once a year, but when I do hear from them, I'm so excited and I'm ready to welcome them like 
you can pick up a conversation that we were having a year ago, right? There's those friends in your life that you have where it doesn't matter how much time or how much distance passes between the two of you. When you see each other, it will be like it was yesterday, like you were back in high school. You know, it will, it will feel the same because of that connection that you had. But also, I want to say a caveat to that as well is just because you have those relationships that are historical, you can outgrow those relationships as well. So you can, just because you were friends in high school, it doesn't mean that person's going to, you know, be around for the long haul of your life. Because needs change and, and things change and, and, and people go through different things at different life stages, like you've said. But if that person wants a place in your life, bottom line, they're going to make it happen. They're going to message you. They're going to keep in contact with you. And there's, there's subtle ways that people do it as well. You might be sitting there expecting, and, and this is also kind of a, a generational thing as well. Um, and I kind of think kind of, you know, to my parents' generation, for example, where they would say, that person hasn't come to visit me in so long, so they can't really care about me, right? We live in, in a technology, social media age, right? I can maybe not visit you, but I can tag you in memes every single day till I'm blue in the face. I can tag you in 30 memes. I can post on your Facebook wall 20 times, you know, and that just shows you that you're still in my thoughts. Um, I'm still actively engaging with your life and sharing things with you and, and kind of trying to demonstrate that you're on my mind in a different way. So we also sometimes have to adjust the way that we expect people to show up in our lives because I would absolutely love to sit and have a glass of wine with my best friend, but she's in Cape Town and I'm in England, so it's not going to happen. But I've got to show other ways to keep that connection kind of going. And if I don't speak to her for four weeks, it's fine. It doesn't matter because with the day I land in Cape Town, you know, we, we back there, we pick up where we left off. So I hope that answers your question, Joe. That was a really, very long winded explanation. <laughs> cool, Em, should we wrap up? Yeah, let's wrap up. Okay, do you wanna say anything else? <laughs> um, no, I just wanna say ladies, thank you so much for your time, for taking time out on your, your Saturday morning. Um, I hope that you, you know, you've kind of walked away with something, you've gained something from this session, even if it was, you know, one little piece of advice or wisdom or anything. Um, my details, I think, are going to be circulated in terms of, you know, the socials, Twitter, Insta, whatever, connect with me. Um, and Stacy said something to me yesterday, which was so important. Um, and I said to her, you know, with the session, what I really wanted, um, you know, kind of all of you to know is that you aren't alone in your journey of experiencing emotions, of wanting to be a better person, of wanting to develop yourself. I mean, that's why all of us are part of this network. Um, so if you feel like you need help in this area or you're just not winning um or you, you've just hit your head against the wall of some sort please please feel free to get in touch with me as well thanks Ames um see I can ask you to put your camera on please so we can take a quick picture okay cool let me go back to my sitting position <laughs> <laughs> Coming. What <laughs> coming attraction? Need a sisterhood, someone to tell you that this is how I deal with my problems. Maybe you should try it. You know, it's, it's life is a very long journey and we need each other. 100%. Okay, ready for the picture? Three, yes. two, one. Cheers, cheers. Awesome, thanks guys.
Thank you, Amy. That was cool. So Thank fun. you. I really appreciate it. Um, we do have a networking event coming up later this month, so feel free to join us. Our lovely host, Joanne, will be taking us through that. So fun. Um, yeah, yeah, if you guys have any suggestions for any kinds of workshops, again, like feel free to DM me. I'm happy to, you know, I'm open to any sort of suggestions and ideas. And if you would like to host a workshop yourself, let's do it. <laughs> cool. Cool. Have a great weekend, guys. Oh, thank you, Amy. Bye, Thanks, Amy. Bye. Have a great Bye. weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye.